It's now two o'clock. Any sign? I'll check my email. It's now two o'clock. Any sign? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I have no emails recorded. So I will start the countdown now. I'm going to give um, Professor Goodwin five more minutes just to give him the chance to turn up. Uh, as, as you know, I invited him to debate academic freedom. He has indicated that academics are silencing him. So I wanted to give him the chance to present his case uh, in a forum where Academics were keen to hear what he had to say, but also have an opportunity to present our own sort of facts. So, um, yeah, we'll start a countdown now, five minutes, and then if he's not here, um, we shall do something else, maybe, with our time. So here we are.
Okay, so um, that that we can now officially register that as of um, two o eight on the first of March, we invited Professor Matthew Goodwin to debate us about academic freedom in the UK, and he decided not to turn up. So uh, we will mark that down as a no-show. Thank you, Professor Goodwin. Um, and what we'll have to do now is, is uh, do another uh, format, I suppose. Uh, I was prepared to debate him. Uh, I was specifically going to ask him about his uh, article in which he described uh, the academic, is it the academic woke hate mob or is it the hate woke academic? I'm not sure exactly what it is, but uh, we will be discussing that instead um, with three other uh, folks who are with me as well as the Zoom gallery. So um, what I'll do is I'll just briefly add everyone on Zoom if, you, if you're if you happy to be recorded briefly just to show everyone that you're here. We're all watching Professor Goodwin not arrive to debate us. I don't know if that counts as no platforming us we did he we did give him the opportunity to debate and he refused so as far as i can tell by the free speech logic we have been no platform now so um i'm sorry that that happened to us but let's see uh zoom galleries here waiting and we'll come back to you shortly for now i'm going to add some guy onto the stream and this is um are you happy to say who you are yeah, I'm I'm Leon. I'm just some guy. I've been accidentally platform. I have no idea what's going on. So uh, yeah, here okay, I am. So, that's great. And uh, we've also got um, here's uh, Phoenix. Hi, Phoenix. Hi, Eric. I'm here because I've got better jackets than um, most of these people claiming that uh, academic freedom is a problem. The jacket is fantastic. The jacket I just is red chairs. <laughs> That's great. And last, uh, we have Carl, um, who is my frequent collaborator. We do a lot of things on civic sociology. Hi, Carl. How are you? Not bad. Got a bit of sunshine. And, so. Yeah, it is nice. I, I, we won't keep everyone for very long. Um, I, I wonder if someone's got some uh, sound on. But anyway, I'm going to, let's see. So what we'll do now is um, we will uh, um, what we'll do now is we will discuss um, some of the issues, but we'll also be exploring the format in general and and sort of think about what we'd like to do. Um, I think part of our plan was to um, invite different free speech warriors to uh, attend a debate, and, and this time works for me. I mean, if, if it doesn't work for them, as I offered to Professor Goodwin, um, he, he did say that he was always happy to debate, and so I took him at his word and said, well, let's debate then. If 2 p.m. Monday doesn't work, we could do another time. Um, but as we can see, he, he has decided not to turn up. So um, we'll... We'll just uh, discuss academic freedom in the UK without him, shall we? Okay, so let's start with just our, our, our group of panelists here. Uh, we've obviously discussed free speech, but as you can tell, we've named it, uh, I guess, a frozen fruit, free speech. What do you, what do you see as being the difference between free speech and free speech. Um, the difference between, I guess, a disingenuous argument and um, uh, one which is held uh, kind of truthfully. So I mean, that might be an interesting starting point. Yeah. And so, uh, Leon, what do you think? What's your thoughts on free speech versus free speech? Well, I think it's, you know, if when free speech is weaponized, then it becomes like a frozen fruit that you can just pelt at people and it hurts. <laughs> so that's that's the image that conjures in my mind. Mm -hmm. 
Phoenix, what do you what do you think? Free speech. I think Good word? Uh, free free speech, as in the, the frozen free, sure. or is a kind of just desserts for anyone who says anything. <laughs> that, um, the people who talk about academic freedom a lot don't like. Um, mm -hmm. Because they want to have free speech, but they really don't react terribly well to anybody being critical of them. You know, they'll do 20 tweet threads or they'll write a report for policy exchange uh, claiming that Churchill should you know, be more respected or something like that. So that's the difference. Camera's still on you, which I think means you have to keep on talking. Why <laughs> <laughs> do I have to talk more than anyone else? My speech is too free, if anything. Yeah. There's an abundance. M more restraint, please. Not least because somebody's sawing behind my head. My speech is restrained by having to work from home and dealing with lots of tools behind me next door. And it's also restricted by uh, Eric's technical issues. I think Eric has just been no platformed by. <laughs> no platformed. <laughs> that Goodwin's email finally arrived, and it's so powerful. It was like I've, I'm not just eating my own book on Sky News; I'm eating Eric. Um, that's the next step to eat the academics that threaten his freedom. Yeah, that was a fun episode, wasn't it? Matthew <laughs> Kidwin e eating his book on Sky News. Um, not, not at least not many academics uh, can claim that they've ever eaten the book on live TV. It wasn't even like the whole book. I think it was just like one page. No, I think, I think that we we should have made him sit there and go through every single page. I'm assuming there were at least three hundred. <laughs> <laughs> was it double weighted? <laughs> <laughs> well, and um, I wonder if if anyone in the in the uh, in the Zoom gallery might also like to comment on uh, free speech. Um, what's what's your take on? Is there a difference between free speech, which I think most of us would agree with, is a good thing, right? I mean, is any one of us against free speech? Like the the proper term? I mean, in general, it's good, right? But it's it's kind of this idea that free speech is a right to the absence of criticism. I think that we have an issue with. But what does anyone? I've, I see uh, Audrey. Would you like to say something? Uh, let's see if I can manage this. Uh, nope. There's Audrey. Hi, Audrey, did you have something you'd like to say? Hi. Hi. Did you say, is free speech also an attempt to preserve? Hi, Audrey, did you have something you'd like to say? Hi. <laughs> oh, I see. If you're watching on YouTube, there's a delay. Yeah, there's a slight delay. Okay, we'll, we'll come back to the gallery. <laughs> And while we're waiting, actually, um, would anyone mind terribly if I did my very exciting free speech live video? Would anyone mind uh, the introduction we've created? It might deplatform you again, Eric. But I'm it might deplatform me, uh, but also Vodafone Internet might also deplatform me. But this is this is a, our free speech live kind of int introduction here. <laughs> Free speech. Hi. I'm interested in how long you spend making that video, <laughs> Eric. 
Yeah. <laughs> and what you were meant to be doing at the time. I've also got another guest um, here with. Let's see. Oh. So someone's off with chicken pox. So she's just going to watch her dad not debate Matt Goodwin. So, um, yeah, that, that, that animation is, is kind of classic. You know, I probably should have been doing a grant application at the time, but um, I decided instead to make a Jordan Peterson Monty Python uh, animation. So, yeah. where do you get the uh, the fart sound for the video? There's a um, website um, of stock sounds. So, yeah. I tried to take your search terms. <laughs> You're gonna make a new video every week for every um, everyone who doesn't show up. Yes. Good. That's the answer I wanted to hear. <laughs> oh, oh, oh! Different one. Well, we have to get yeah. up to the yeah. level of where we get Jordan Peterson on. So that kind of leads us to maybe the next question. And I'm sorry for the technical issues for those of you watching on Zoom, um, but there seems to be a delay. Between, um, so you, if you can, uh, I'll, I'll just say, could you post questions here? There's basically a delay of around 10 seconds. Yeah, there's a 10 second delay. So I can't actually, I thought I could do live interviews with folks on Zoom, but um, that's not going to be possible. But you can post your questions either here or directly on YouTube, and we can, John uh, Connett. I had previously asked whether we were waiting for Godot. It does feel like that sometimes. But what, what, what I think we'd like to do for the discussion uh, with the initial thoughts is what we had in mind with this program was a lot of the uh, – oh, so someone has indicated that the delay is no platforming them now. So <laughs> – <laughs> Um, that's unfortunate. Um, it's more like a stunted platform than no platform. I would say. <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, we what we wanted to do was to take folks who kind of do this regular, you know, there's a media frenzy of free speech warriors that um, kind of say that there's this crisis that everyone's being silenced, that there's no platforms and, and we're unable to do these debates. And that's an open discussion. I'm not, I'm not even saying that that's not true. It's just that those media reports never present the, the, the sort of position that maybe that's not true. And, and what are the evidence that someone like Matthew Goodwin is, is presenting when he says that universities are these kind of, left-wing madrasas or whatever. I, I realize that's Toby Young, but it just goes to show you there's so many of these people that what we'd like to do is, is sort of invite them each week. I'm just impressed that they can manage to indoctrinate students or anyone can indoctrinate students because just getting them to read the reading list or turn up to... Uh, to, to talk on online teaching is quite difficult. Yeah, I mean, I've been trying more or less for the past, what, let's say 20 years to indoctrinate my students into using the Oxford comma. Um, and I, I, it, it still hasn't met with much success so far. So, you know, may, may, maybe students are not as easily indoctrinated as one would think. Well, most of the students I teach are that tend to be Chinese or from China. So, if I was indoctrinating them into communism, that'd be quite yeah. difficult because <laughs> they're members of the party. So they've already achieved a higher level of communism than I could ever attempt in an academic setting. Yeah, I mean, obviously, in, in communist China, students indoctrinate you, right? Um. <laughs> this is it. So I'm slightly worried that maybe I'm resisting these free speech warriors because I've already been indoctrinated by teaching over the past five, six years. <laughs> I, I, I literally can't see the problem. And, um, perhaps these warriors um, do not teach international students. 
as much. Um, I tend to teach in a more rarefied setting than I do, I think. I think, you know, to, to a certain extent, I've been no platform by just, you know, lack of time, really. I think if I had more time, if time was friendlier to me, um, then I would be be more easily platform on all sorts of platforms. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, like how much work actually Matthew Goodwin and many of the other free speech warriors actually do, right? because they just seem to have a lot of time to churn out articles for the Daily Mail, the Daily Telegraph and the Spectator. And I'm just like, I can barely like get through the day. <laughs> yeah, who else should we be inviting? And can we work out who from the number of bylines that they've got in right-wing media? Is that no, I, would like to, yeah, I would like to see Nigel Bigar's workload model. <laughs> I'd like to see his impact case study. <laughs> because I, I don't think it creates a great research environment in the ref just to wind up everybody else in your field. I don't think that actually counts as impact having dissected impact as part of uh, my PhD thesis and what counts and what doesn't. I'm pretty sure just annoying people doesn't count. But I'd like to see how it's defined in that institution. So that's what I'd ask him if he came. Well, I'm just, I'm just curious to know kind of what... So I, I, I do recognize that there are instances of, say, no platforming or whatever, but even... Policy exchange needs to kind of inv invent this Germaine Greer situation that happened, where it, it's it's unclear whether no platforming, where someone is actively prevented from joining a debate. Which, first of all, how many of you have ever been to a participate? Academic work doesn't actually take place in like a physical <laughs> debate stage. It's been so rare. Well, also, when those people come, you don't get to debate them. I had this discussion with a senior academic at my institution that um, I think it was Greer or somebody like that who was meant to be coming to Sheffield. And I said, well, the thing is, I wouldn't get to debate her. Like, she would be sat on a stage with another very senior academic, presumably one of the people involved in inviting her or somebody else senior, and then there would be a highly curated... Q&A maybe at the end, but I'm pretty sure I'd be thrown out if I asked her about the paedophilia in some of her past work or something like that. You know, it's not, it, it's not really, debates isn't really how we do the work. And those big talks where they don't, where people protest, which isn't the same as being deplatformed, it's just people exercising their right to disagree. Those people do not get to sit on a panel on stage and debate. You know, when Goodwin and Goodwin and Calhoun had their controversially titled race debate, there weren't loads of racialized undergraduate students allowed to sort of throw in their awe at that. And I think it's kind of the the stem of the problem is that people are allowed to make, as I said, I think these arguments are being made are very kind of disingenuous, but they're allowed to make those arguments in a silo. So it means that then there isn't because there isn't any debate, there is no platform by which they're actually challenged and it allows them to kind of gather ahead of steam. And that's why, I mean, obviously we knew that Goodwin would turn up, but I think that's why uh, free speech is potentially a, a useful opportunity if anyone does actually turn up to, to actually have a debate on a level playing field or an equal playing field so that you can start to inspect a little bit some of the things that can kind of easily be said and might sound kind of convincing to others in a very kind of microcosm kind of way. But actually, if you analyze them there, there's nothing there. It's, it's empty, vacuous rhetoric. So. Yeah, and it does is disinviting no platforming. Like, you know, if we invite Nigel Bigger next week and then we go, ah, oh, no, we'll have somebody else first. Try, try and go for the big guns, get George and Peterson early, go big or go home. Like if we then disinvited Nigel Bigger, I sent him another email saying, "No, you're all right, mate. Leave it. We'll we'll do it. We'll do it in a few months." <laughs> Would that be no platforming? I think I think Eric has no platform himself by not not unmuting. 
<laughs> Just shouting into the void. Yeah, Eric, Eric, yeah, Eric, you still, yeah, no platform yourself. Um, and well, yeah, and also it seems like it, the the, um, the definition of no platform is now stretched to the extent that like not being invited to something, it's yeah. also no platforming. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, people were complaining because the first person Eric wanted to debate was Matt Goodwin, that he was therefore deplatforming all women. Yeah. <laughs> and being, being blocked on Twitter is apparently no platforming, not just you being annoying and me not wanting to hear you. So it, 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 it's stretched very thin now, isn't it? To the point where Gavin Williamson is on stage talking about academic freedom and then defending a master's student who's really, really homophobic for being homophobic. I don't think that's really covered by academic freedom in any way. All of these terms are being stretched beyond any kind of useful definition. It's not what the public understand by no platforming, free speech, academic freedom. It's not like there aren't definitions out there. Somebody saying they don't like your stuff or not inviting you to a thing is not crushing your academic freedom. Yeah. Particularly not if you're being rewarded in other ways. I mean, where is my chair? <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, awesome. yeah, you and I haven't been given one yet. It's not like I haven't tried to manifest this, you know, in the Noel Edmonds style of writing it down and saying <laughs> I know what needs to happen. I've written it down on Twitter quite a lot of times, you know. Yeah. There are people with the power out there to make that happen and they haven't. So where is my literal platform? I would quite like, you know, some sort of raised stage. Or a plinth. Yeah, a plinth. I'd love a plinth. <laughs> in Oxford or you're not really playing. Well, and there's, well, I mean, there's clearly a power dynamic as well because it's like these people have access. To, I mean, do they have the telegraph on speed dial? The t how how does Nigel Bigard does he have a column that he says the same thing over and over again? Because every single week he seems to be saying he's being silenced. And I okay, taking a step back. I, th I, I personally don't like the idea of actual physical, you know, stopping people from giving a speech. I think you could do a protest like there's um, at Bristol a while ago. There were some students who protested Eric Kaufman speaking and they stood up and walked out silently. And it's like, OK, that was disruptive. But for like 30 seconds, uh, but both Kaufman and Goodwin acted like this was this was, you know, the start of a slippery slope in, until eventually everyone would be silenced and whatnot. And even they weren't silenced. And I think that's kind of, are we worried about the idea that of actual no platforming instances, because those happen almost never, or are we talking about petitions or protests to say you shouldn't speak and then they speak anyway, because in that instance, the protest is also free speech. So I'm for that. Um, There's a lot uh, of, of, of chilling effects. So like the two of the rhetorical techniques that these people use a lot in their columns and reports for dodgy think tanks and what have you, are uh, that it has a chilling effect, anybody at all saying that they don't like what you're doing. That, uh, you know, the novelists, Lionel Shriver, and there's another one today, um, you know, saying, oh, you can't say anything these days in your work, and therefore, you know, people are centering themselves. So it's that chilling effects thing. And then there's the, oh, well, you may say that I'm a professor or I have an OBE, and then, or, most of these people who have stage are very powerful people with lots of plaudits. But I'm speaking on behalf of lots of other people who don't get that opportunity. But again, there's only a few examples that they ever wheel out. Like they don't even have anonymized good examples. They set up websites where people can send them in any old tut to say that they've been silenced, but they don't have any, you know, the lurkers who agree with them on email are not sending them examples. The only examples they ever give are like one PhD student who's Kathleen Stock's favorite, who has been platformed multiple times in um, the Telegraph and the Times. Uh, and Noah Carl, like, 
everyone knows who he is. So it's right. not like there's a stack of people that these people are speaking on behalf of because they have access to the media. They don't. They can't even give anonymized examples. It's all hypotheticals. Right. And then there's websites that various people have set up recently asking you to send in examples of wokeness. Yeah. Also, well, and I think, and I think, I think we can have a discussion about should Noah Carl have been removed from his position? I personally think yes, but not because I mean I, I personally don't like race science or whatever, but um, you know I I don't think that he should have been removed just for that. I think he should have been removed because he was disingenuous on his application for the position. Um, and then when they went back and found out what he actually studied, they said, actually, you know, we don't want you for a JRF anymore. But you could go through each of these examples and say, and, you know, weigh the merits. But I actually even think that's almost missing the point, which is, as you said, there's like hyp hypotheticals. There's a lot of hypotheticals going on. And it's also just not the case that this is happening often enough to warrant really any intervention. I mean, because that's what we're talking about, is that they're saying that this is an epidemic that's so far out of control that the government needs to intervene to stop academics from being a woke hate mob. But they never speak out about prevent. Well, no, that, I mean, they're, they're hypocritical. They, they're they're not, they're wrong. Not examples of right. people being able to think, say, and do things, or and they don't speak out about the university becoming a, an outpost of border control. You know that we universities monitor attendance and things like that in order to keep people's visas. Like that, far more chilling. Whatever your views on immigration, that has far more chilling effect on academia. Even yeah. without getting into the stuff that Leon was talking about, of literally not having the time to do the job there are so many crises why pick this one why is this one the most important crisis to them yeah well yeah i mean coming back to you know what what we were saying like um i mean like so i think it, it's it's fairly common knowledge now that um university of leicester senior management has been um monitoring the um social media accounts of uh, a number of academics at Leicester whom they are planning to make redundant. And I mean, that seems to me to be a far more uh, chilling effect, right? You can't even talk about your working conditions. You can't even talk about the fact that you're about to be sacked on social media. Um, so I think what's really going on here with, you know, Matthew Goodwin, Eric Kaufman, and a number of people, I mean, I think they're essentially making two demands. They're making, the first demand is basically compulsory platforming. So like they just want to be able to speak whenever, wherever, regardless of whether the organizers or you want to hear it or not. Uh, and then I think the second demand that they're making is basically compulsory agreement or compulsory adulation. Um, they're probably used to being, um, well, if not actively adored or adulated, they're probably used to being tolerated um, in their department simply by virtue of their very senior profession um, at the senior position. Um, simply because you know, um, like you 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 don't want to piss off the head of department or something like that. So, whereas once they've found out, you know, they've entered the quote unquote public sphere, they start appearing on social media. Uh, if they post stupid stuff, then people push back uh, and people often very rude to Eric Kaufman and Matthew Goodwin on Twitter yeah. for even bad reasons. Uh, well, they're they're used to be conducted in a certain style. So, you know, it all being sort of a rhetorical game and people, you know, Debate as in when you present work at a conference and somebody goes, oh, did you really need to use that method? Have you read such and such? I'm not sure your argument is all that clear. That's the kind of debate they will accept. And they won't, they won't accept somebody saying, hang on, I'm one of the minorities that you're chatting shit about. Can you please stop? Because nine times out of ten, it's not about diversity of thought as in, 
heterodox views of economics or you know views on where the borders should be in geography it's i want to be really really racist I want and to have say no consequences. And have no consequences. I want to try to get Stonewall shut down in a 23 20 tweet thread and have no consequences. But that's actually not being an adult, is it? Students are a tool of another state and have no consequences. That's not freedom of thought, is it? It's just having no consequences. It's not. I don't want to use the words cancel culture because they're just kind of crap. But they just don't want they, they don't want any consequences. Their platform must come with, if not deference, then lightness and nothing being out of bounds. You, can, you should be allowed to hate crime as much as you want. Like they're resisting the Equality Act at this point. That that piece that we were in in The Guardian the other day, you know, pitted the requirements of the Equality Act against feminists and trans activists ignoring the fact that most trans people are feminists it was kind of going oh well we'll break the equality act for free speech for this one group is, is that what they're asking to do is that is that academic freedom because it's not in the ucu definition of academic freedom no well there is there are issues around uh the ucu that we could get into um yeah. and we will have time but i wonder if um, one thing we could do, because Matthew Goodwin did not turn up, um, I was wondering if we might um, look through the claims that he's made, right? Um, and do help us uh, if you're on Zoom or via YouTube. Let us know if we're interpreting this correctly. Um, and as you can see, I've also got a, 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 a friendly helper on my shoulder, which makes it difficult to zoom in here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one-handed um so we've got academics like me live in fear of the woke hate mob so there's a single a woke hate one. one yeah. yes yeah. i think did michael gove call us the blob or was it teachers that were the blob teachers that were the blob okay. yeah so academics but he's an academic so he's saying he academics like him so i'm curious as to know i think his point is that he he's a brexiteer i think the third paragraph literally spells out his position right because the third paragraph says you know since brexit i've fallen out of love with my job avoid my colleagues and look to a future with a sense of dread which then just basically suggests that you know some of his colleagues might have been a bit rude to him <laughs> right and so this is this is the consequences thing i mean there's nothing stopping him from saying, and to be honest, I don't. I don't think that people, sh all people who voted Brexit, should be shunned from society. I mean, but they are, you know, they are the government. You know, like they're not. They're not like a minority position when they're, you know, in charge of all institutions. <laughs> I mean, people um, are going to say, "You won, Matt. You know, enjoy the money." You have all the decorum. <laughs> like they're allowed to meme back at him. Is that not appropriate? Yeah, and I don't understand why. Like, there, there's no law that says people have to be nice to you all the time, and like sit at your dinner table or whatever. But um, yeah, I think it's. I think he's he's after compulsory affirmation and compulsory adoration. It's like, why don't people love me anymore? Well, you know, first of all, people don't have to love each other in an academic department. All you have to do is just, you know, uh, do the job and collaborate in a professional way. Like, otherwise, you don't have to hang out with your colleagues in the pub after work. You don't have to have, you know, very personal conversations with them if you don't want to have to agree with their politics or do anything with them. Um, yeah. Is well, academics, the the like unwoke mob, like because they seem a lot more organised than we are. Yes, and that's part of the motivation for this um, this kind of live stream is just to say, you know, let's have a space where we can we can talk about why are people accusing us of being like literally a hate mob. I mean, what what is? I mean, I picture like a. Like kind of uh, pitchforks, flaming torches. 
I mean, I in in this article, he's pointing to one professor told me to my face I was disinvited from a workshop in my area of research because of my views on Brexit. So how is that second hand or third hand? <laughs> Well, just, you know, if that has really happened, um, Professor Goodwin, um, first of all, join a union, <laughs> um, open some sort of casework, talk to a, a UCU rep, um, and secondly, um, you know, like actually talk about who the people are involved are, <laughs> assuming that this is not a made up situation. Well, tell yeah. us the topic, because like his topic's quite wide. I mean, if the workshop was about what do we do now after Brexit as pro-European academics, <laughs> and then he's just come out saying, I love Brexit, Brexit is great, they probably weren't going to go, oh, yeah, oh, Matt, sorry, we're, we're going to have to rescind that in invitation because we don't think you're really that relevant to this at this time. Since you don't well, like and, you. Well, and also, I mean, I can... But, you know, workshops are limited events. They're they're sort of people working on something that's specific, and they and you know anyone who's ever organized a workshop before is also going to realize that you know it, it it takes a lot of you want to get the dynamics right. A lot of it has to do with like personal kind of relationships with one another, and you know it could be that one of the other attendees might potentially be a jerk because they were, you know, uh, an FBP, you know, like radical European or whatever. And so you just didn't want to get the dynamics right. But that, that, that happens all the time. I mean, that, that's the kind of thing that academics confront all the time. I mean, this isn't specific to him having the, those views, is it? No, you don't have an inherent right to be on a platform in the, in the, in this in the same way that um, you know you, you're not inherently invited to everything like it's not yeah. like what why should you be what what puts you in that position so it's, it's yeah, and again it's it's purposely vague that, that sentence sometimes it's like you're trying to marry ma manage um, a wedding or another event like after a after a divorce you know because it's not like <laughs> It's not like Matt's quite calm on social media. It's not like everyone is directing stuff at him and then he's, he's never saying anything or just a, tweeting occasional links to his work, right? He argues with people on social media and then he blocks a lot of people on social media, like people who disagree with him. And then I think he also name searches, like, which is he's completely within his right to do. I block a lot of Absolutely. people. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's totally fine. But I mean, if you were organizing an event and you're going, well, this person, this person had a massive Barney last week, and I absolutely do not want to have to deal with that when I'm moderating this event. We need to pick the person, we need to pick a side, and it's not about whether they're pro or anti-EU or whether I like this person more or not. It's just I need to pick the person whose work is more relevant because we're going to have to drop one of them just not to have a massive row. Yeah. Here's Patrick but on YouTube asking... Someone said the other day, what are the specific material consequences that you live in fear of? Professor Goodwin. I mean, well, defunded. Yeah, but I mean, the, I would really love to have, it's like the same thing as I would love to have an OBE or whatever, you know, it's like how terrible for you to become a knight of the realm. It's like, the if anything, folks seem to ascend once they take up this kind of I've been silenced position. It's, like the third, it's the third pathway, isn't it? Like there's there's teaching and, and scholarship, teaching and research, and then there's being enough of an arsehole that you can be, get made professor. Like some of these people were professors before and then they just got extra jobs, like being invited to be part of a think tank or whatever. Some people got elevated professorship during all of this and they hadn't published because it of it and they hadn't brought in more funding so it obviously has some material benefit apart from any money they might get for writing columns or doing talks or whatever it clearly has some benefit well, when you get promoted and the media clearly just likes the noise of it all don't they i mean 
it's pure, it's perfect clickbait. And, and also, the, this is something that I got into a, a minor argument with Kathleen Stock on Twitter, where I was saying, you know, if you, if you do this no platforming thing, it's a perfect way to promote your ideas. And you become this like well known person because it's just like any form of censorship. It's like once something's censored, people will say, Oh, what's so dangerous about this that I'm going to go look? And then they go and look, and it sort of it's almost like amplifies the message. And, and from an academic point of view, so that's the way that the mass media infra like ecosystem works, but that's not how academia works. Like academia has an interest of what's true or not, or what's ethical. Or you, you manufacture a conflict, or you manufacture the, the idea of your own censorship, and then you create a space where you then need to be compulsor compulsorily platformed. So it's a, it's a completely man manufactured thing, but I think there's, it feeds on this idea of, um, I don't know, cultural outrage, or the idea that I know on, on, a, on a very kind of superficial kind of mass media, daily mail sense, you can turn around and say, well, there are certain things that you could say 30 years ago to people and you can't say today. It's like, well, well, well yeah, there's, there's a reason for that. But if you, ha if you always have that as your starting point and then you say, well, therefore, the things I say should have no consequence and you end up in this kind of circular, ridiculous world. Yeah, it's like things change. Like, I, I can't call different people, like, Avondruk or whatever anymore because they just don't know what that word means. Because I don't even know what area that's from. But, you know, those things happen. It's it's fine. I mean, as a, as a UCU rep, I'm g genuinely concerned and interested in the kind of fear that Matthew Goodwin claims that he's living under. I mean, I would, I would just really like to know, like, what's happening? I mean, in the Daily Mail article, he, he's claiming that he has, uh, there's a long list of academics, he has colleagues who are being harassed or sacked because of their views on issues like Brexit. And I'm just, I would just like really like to know what's happening to these people. Uh, I don't think I've heard of a single case of somebody being sacked uh, as a result of being a Brexiter. Um, and if that's really happening, I would like to know more detail. Yeah, we'd like to support these people, you know, if they're actually genuinely receiving, you know, threats to their employment, as opposed, as opposed to people just disagreeing with them or perhaps not wanting to associate with them socially or not wanting to work with them on a particular project. Like, I'm always feeling empathetic towards people who feel that they are being marginalized as a marginalized person myself. Yeah, and um, just looking at the Zoom, I'm sorry I'm not able to take the video questions directly, but Jonathan Portes is pointing out that, you know, they did a debate on, on Brexit and he's provided a link uh, to the podcast that Goodwin and he, but I, I've, I've, I've seen Goodwin sort of respond to any criticism as 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 being this kind of intolerance of him, and it, and it is there a certain point at which we can say maybe you're being a bit too sensitive? This goes back to <laughs> there's there's uh, are you a snowflake or a hate mob? It's kind of like there's got to be some consistency, I think, if especially if we're going to throw around these really inflammatory words, because I personally don't do that. I can, I can see on Twitter that some people do, but I've seen, you know, Jonathan Portes is on, on the call. I've seen him interact and, and just explain, like, Eric Kaufman's statistics are awful. Like, they're genuinely not statistically accurate. How are you supposed to have a conversation about that? Hmm. And he's partly it, without it being like, oh, you're such a, you're like a woke sorcerer. Ah! Yeah. It's partly an artifact of celebrity, I think, to an extent, because when you make yourself into one of these big public figures, where you actively seek a much bigger, bigger audience than just your academic peers, and you've got thirty thousand plus followers, whatever, um, that the volume of everything that comes is much bigger for good and bad. And I think 
a lot of those people, celebrities, not just in the academic world, stop being able to recognise the difference between disagreement, abuse and rudeness. Like they're, they're three different things. And so you get people going, oh, I got so much stuff. I got 28,000 tweets of hate. And then you go and look through what was directed at that celebrity. And there's probably, you know, 20,000 tweets of agreement. And there's like a few hundred tweets that are disagreement. And then there's some tweets that are just rude, that just say, you know, fuck off or whatever. And then there's only maybe two or three that are genuinely abusive and quite often they'll be from they'll have no real intent behind them because they're from complete burner accounts that have got five followers and they're people who don't even realize that the person at the other end because they're so well known will even see it but to yeah. that person that's that person who's made themselves a celebrity all they see is a volume of stuff and they interpret all of the stuff that isn't 100 percent positive as abuse even you know drag queen sister sister's been in the media yeah couple of weeks on drag race and I looked at the tweets that have been directed at her and yet there were people who were saying she should die and they were absolutely terrible accounts with like 11 followers but they were absolutely terrible but a lot of it was just oh I didn't think very much of that look and she put them all into one basket because that's how it felt for her yeah. as a well person being bombarded but it's not the truth and an academic of all people who looks at sentiments and a public opinion I mean, that's what Matt looks like, isn't it? It's, it's public opinion. It should yeah, be able it's, to... It's, what's the proportionate response here? Uh, because ultimately, our, isn't what they're, what they're saying is that we should... They're expecting us to control the behavior of several hundred thousand people. You know, like, how am I supposed to control the behavior of some rando on Twitter? Like, who happened to read Adorno or whatever. Like, I, I'm not... I, I have no means of, of kind of affecting what they do with their lives. Uh, I can do my own research in which I spend, you know, a lot of time trying to do it well. And, you know, I try to engage publicly. Um, but, but at the end of the day, it's like it's either up to Twitter to, to manage its own standards or, uh, there are ways of, you know, making your account private or whatever else. Like, and you can also just not say controversial things if you need to, like the weekend off, right? Like, you know, like no. just save it for when you're prepared to deal with it. Yeah. I'm not even saying don't ever do it. Just like take your moments. And some <laughs> some, some examples they just they bring up as if. They real like there's a there's a lot of people who say, well, trans activists are terrible because they do bomb threats, and they bring up this example over and over that was uh, a few years ago when they were trying to have a Women's Place UK meeting, and this rando account that nobody knew, like not a known activist, not you know not a trans person even, like made a joke about a bomb threat, and then a bit later rescinded it and said, oh, I didn't mean it. I was just going to go and get my KFC something like that but it keeps being brought up over and over again so if johnny's asking if twitter's managed its standards is that not no platforming i mean i think i think twitter is a private company that you know um they have they want a certain atmosphere and they want a certain set of things to happen within that platform and they don't want you know, like hate groups using it to promote their ideas. And so if they say we're we're going to draw the line here, that's up to them, I think, as a private company. Um, so uh, what I mean by that is, is, is saying if academics are rude on Twitter, that's not my personal fault as like an academic at the University of Manchester. And I have no idea how I could stop them from doing that to Goodwin. If he's if he doesn't want them to criticize him, it's the all only solution I would have is to is to not participate on Twitter. Which, you know, I'm I wouldn't I don't think that that's necessary, and because but that's because I don't think that what he's confronting is is beyond the pale. I mean, I think it's relatively normal pushback for when you say things that people don't agree with. Like people will disagree with you also. 
using their free speech. Yeah. I think coming back to what Phoenix was saying about celebrity and fandom, which of course, you know, Phoenix knows plenty about, because um, that's what she's working on. I want, I'm just wondering if like Matthew Goodwin basically has posting disease. Like essentially, like he's just posting and posting stuff and everything he does is geared towards more posting and like writing stuff in the Daily Mail and Daily Telegraph in order to post more. Like it's a form, it's almost kind of like, you know, obviously I don't want to medicalize anybody, but like, like looking at it from a surface, like sometimes it almost looks like a form of sort of internet addiction type of situation going on. Like you want this kind of attention. And so- Well, there's that kind of like adrenaline rush of Twitter, isn't there? Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, he's seeking engagement. And it, uh, it's obviously it's it's thrilling, and it you and for everything that he says that drives people wild and makes people really upset, he also has a base for that who think it's absolutely amazing and love it, and he gets more invites to more things, so he doesn't want to stop. If he stops posting, all the other exciting things stop happening to him, and he stops gaining in followers. He knows that he could go away and quietly do what work on polling for the next 20 years and have and keep his professorship and keep bringing funding in and have a fine academic career and then post every now and then on twitter and go my new paper's out yeah exactly post your abstract <laughs> post your whatever screenshot yeah, or, 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 or post that stuff and in between chat to academics about their cats and well yeah and i'm sure that that's what you know that's also what i think a lot of us would like to do i think uh this is, might be a good point to kind of think towards next time, but, you know, I, I personally don't, I mean, look, at, look, I don't particularly want to be doing this <laughs> live stream at two o'clock on a Monday, but I do feel like there has to be some point at which we call their bluff, if nothing else, and just say, you know, you're invited to debate. So w we have to decide who are we going to debate next? We, 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 it's going to have to be Nigel Bigar. I mean, come on, we, you have to keep on no platforming women like in general, <laughs> by just inviting like, and then next week, the week after is going to be Eric Kaufman and, and so on. So yeah, that's your okay. Okay, so we're going to do, because um, see, I was really keen to, to think about Michelle Donnellan. Oh yeah, that's a big one, yeah. Not least because she used to work for WWE. And yeah. so you know, I'd like to ask her about free speech and wrestling and how much of what she's saying about academic free speech and about academia in general is just kayfabe. Like we're not, yeah. we're, we're, we're meant to suspend our disbelief when she says that stuff because she's just chanting to her base and that's fine. They're basically yeah. like two competing visions of academia. Like one vision is like academia is just like Oxford or Cambridge Union Society debates. And then it's like Michelle Donnellan, whose vision of higher education is like, yeah, wrestling. I yeah, like but, then it's, but then it's like weird kind of like you can't remove things you don't like or I, I, the consistency is something that I just don't understand. So we'll have to work that out. But it sounds like the consensus is Nigel Bigger. Yes. What does yeah. everyone want to do? No, it's just, just to say, I think it's very consistent, actually, if you think about it. Like, you know, we know um, wrestling is like fake competition. Winners, are, winners and losers are decided in advance. Uh, everything follows the script and uh, the, the performers are just supposed to deliver and the audience are just supposed to like pay money and play along with this kind of charade. And I think that's pretty much matches um, Michelle Donnellan's vision of our education. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, yeah. It um... moves unless everyone's complicit. I mean, I've before, before COVID, I was training to be a professional wrestler and you cannot do a lift or a throw without both participants in that uh, collaborating like you have to the person who's being thrown has to jump at the same time as the person who's throwing them lifts them it's it you know everyone involved has to be complicit so in Michelle Donnellan's version she's just getting very very annoyed that academics are not engaging <laughs> <laughs> Why are we not providing assists in these lifts and throws and slams? 
Like, why, yeah, are, we, I mean, why are we not allowing it to be suplexed? There's that great Roland Bart essay about the wrestling match in and, and the way it's just, there is no end game. It's just excitement. He's going to create And there, someone did a great analysis of Trump as being like, he was literally a pro wrestler at one point. Um, and he understands that, or at least he did, and he used Twitter until he was kicked off for inciting insurrection. It's nice to know that's the line. When it's people are like, oh, there's a slippery slope on Twitter, it's like, yeah, you can't incite insurrection and storming of the US. But, you know, take it back from that <coughs> line a bit and you're fine. But um, anyway, like the idea of just making noise and getting people heated, even if they disagree with you, is, is kind of the essence of the wrestling sort of medium. And to a certain extent, I, th I feel like we're in, in this program, which we'll do again next week, we're sort of in a certain way trying to do a civilized version of the same thing, which kind of like, we challenge you, Nigel Bigar, <laughs> to debate us knowing that he's not going to but um, we'll also work uh, ahead of next week. We'll work on constructing our permanent wall of records of, of when people officially refuse to debate us. So thank you to everyone for joining us and to Phoenix, some guy, Leon, Carl, thank you for this experiment. I think all things considered, my internet only broke twice, I think. So, um, and I've only got one baby who's asleep so we're we're all good to go i think and thank you to everyone on zoom um this will be recorded for posterity so if you'd like to catch up and and and, and watch again <laughs> please subscribe to our channel <laughs> and tune in again uh next it's week green thanks everybody for his next paper <laughs> i look forward to green goodwin screenshotting it for his next paper yeah exactly this is, this is the so academic good. hate Woke mob in action. Yeah. yeah, we can be the woke mob. The woke mob, but just the schwa. I I want this video to be uh to be compulsorily cited in all of people's <laughs> future publications. Well, we can, well, well, we can officially say this is the day academics agreed to debate him and he refused. And we'll just do it every week. We'll go through the list. So Keep a running tally, everyone, um, and we will see you next week. Thanks, everyone. Free speech. Oh.